Great. All righty. Well, uh, this is, if my memory serves me right, the third in a series of six uh, lectures that uh, mm -hmm. David Leaving is uh, providing us. This one is called Cordoba and the Golden Age of Muslim Spain. And we'll have the next one two weeks from now on July 14th. So um, turn over the floor to David. Thank you, David. Okay, I'm going to share. Hopefully, uh, can, you can see this. Everybody uh, able to see the first slide? Looks good to yes. me. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is the first of three lectures about uh, Jews that lived in Muslim uh, countries, in Muslim cities. Um, today is Cordoba in Spain. Two weeks will will be Fez in Morocco, and uh, in a month it'll be Cairo in, in Egypt. And it so happens that uh, Maimonides lived in all three of these cities, so he'll be mentioned in, in each one of the lectures. All right, so in the fifth century CE, the Roman Empire had fallen apart in the West, and the Germanic tribes moved into Western Europe and various ones conquered different parts of Western Europe and it was the Visigoths that uh, conquered Spain. And uh, soon after their uh, conquest, they converted to uh, Catholicism. Um, I, I just want you to sort of bear in mind these dates and we'll flesh out the history and whatever as we go along, but just try to, these are, dates that you want to sort of peg in your mind, okay? In 711, the Islamic armies, which had started in Saudi Arabia and moved uh, across North Africa as part of their conquest, crossed over into Spain and conquered Spain, almost all of it except for one portion in the north. In 756, um, the empire, the caliphate, of the Umayyads was overthrown by the Abbasids. The reason why that's important is, first of all, the empire shifted in terms of its capital from Damascus to Baghdad, but also the last Umayyad caliph fled to Spain and actually then took control of Spain and Spain stayed out of the general Islamic caliphate. So it was sort of on its own uh, and unique in, in certain ways that we'll get into. Now the Christians began from the north to reconquer Spain and by 1236, they reached Cordoba. And this was not bad for the Jews at first because they were, uh, they and the Muslims that were living there were um, not persecuted. But in 1492, the last Islamic city-state, Granada, was conquered by the Christians. And at that point, they, the, the Christian uh, monarch said, either convert or get out. So th this is the traumatic event in which Jews uh, were exp ex uh, expelled from Spain, although some uh, converted and stayed, and some pretended to convert and stayed. All right, so those are the, those are the sort of uh, dates that you want to bear in mind as a framework, and we'll fill in from there. Now, this is a, a map of, um, of Visigothic Spain, and they controlled part of southern France. But I, I want to point out uh, this river here. It's called the Guadalavir, and it's the only navigable river in Spain. And if you notice, two major cities lie along this river, Cordoba and Seville. Uh, have any of you been to either one of these cities? Both. I'll raise your hands so I can see how many people have been there. Okay. All right, now, uh, because of its connection to the Atlantic, as well as its proximity to the Mediterranean, uh, and also the, the fact that it was well watered part of Spain. It was uh, a sought after area. The Romans actually 
built a, a good size uh, city there. And, um, and then ultimately it became the capital of Islamic Spain for a while. Now this is a, a picture of the Islamic armies. And so the question here is how could a group of light cavalry conquer all of the Persian empire and a good portion of the, of the Byzantine empire and then a portion of the old Roman empire, the Western empire. And the reason is a couple of issues. One is that the Persians and the Byzantines had been at war with each other for centuries. And Bernard Lewis describes the situation as the 20th round of a fight where the fighters can barely keep their fists up. So they had depleted each other and allowed this heavily uh, committed religious group to uh, overwhelm the, the Persian empire and take at least half of the Byzantine. Now here, here's the situation before the, um, the, the Arab armies emerged. So this is the Byzantine empire here. And so you can see that it uh, encompasses uh, the Balkans, some of Italy, and then essentially all of what was the Eastern empire of Rome. Uh, Spain is by this time Visigothic and other parts of Europe were occupied by different peoples depending on what part of Europe you were in. Now this is the picture of what it's like in about the year 800. And you can see the Islamic uh, uh, caliphate goes all the way out, you know, it's off the map and then all the way through North Africa. And then ultimately in the, in the beginning of the eighth century takes Spain and then the small area up north uh, uh, stays independent as, as a Christian uh, city states and then later just moves farther and farther and farther south until they reconquer. Now, by the way, if you have any questions or comments, just jump in. I mean, I welcome any kind of interaction or a chance to um, clarify things that you may not be clear on. So I told you about the, the Guadalavir River and the Romans actually uh, founded the city in 169 BCE. I told you that it was captured um, by the Islamic army in 711. And by the year 1000, there were 400,000 people living in Cordoba. It was one of the great cities of the world. Some people say it was the greatest city of the, in the world at the time because of the fluorescence of science, philosophy, poetry. Uh, there were libraries. The whole city was lit by lamps. Uh, you know, uh, it was just a, an amazing place and there was religious toleration. So that even though the Christians and the, the, the uh, Jews were not at the top rung, in other words, they had to pay a little more taxes or whatever. In most other ways, they were completely free to practice the way they wanted, to, to, to gain entrance to any um, profession that they wanted, whether it was medicine or you name it. They were in the military. Um, they were in the diplomatic corps. Uh, and actually, the Muslims uh, trusted the Jews a bit more because there was no way they were gonna take over or rebel uh, and take over the country. They were just too small a percentage of the population. Whereas they always worried about whether the Christians under their control might essentially become a fifth column uh, and during the reconquest. Um, as I mentioned, there was this cross fertilization. In other words, for example, with poetry, there would be poetry contests. They would be, you know, the, the Jews would, would join and they would write in Arabic. There were separate contests in Hebrew. Uh, the doctors consulted with one another, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you'll notice, what is the similarity in this respect 
to Alexandria. Remember the kind of atmosphere there? Anybody? Was there a cross fertilization between Greek and and, mm. and Jewish, uh, uh, you know, scientists and whatever? Yes. Mm. Was there religious toleration? Yes. So it's in these kinds of situations in history that the Jews do best. They 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 they, they flourish, and when uh, they're uh, uh, and and so this was a special time in in Jewish history, and when. Spain, when they were kicked out of Spain, this was a major trauma for Jews uh, for centuries after that. They mourned the loss of this society. Now, here, here's a recreation of the Islamic city of Cordoba. Here's the river. There's a bridge that connects both sides of the, of the, of, of the uh, uh, shores of the river. And notice here, this is the large mosque. If any of you have been to Cordoba, this is one of the most beautiful things to see. And it was this area right here in which the bulk of the Jews lived, although they were able to live anywhere they wanted, they wanted to be near the synagogues and whatever. So they clustered in this area. Now here's a picture of modern Cordoba. This bridge was actually built by the Romans. And then you can see what was the Grand Mosque when the Christians came in, they, they uh, converted it to a church, but large portions of the building were kept as is. Now here's one of the iconic views of the Grand Mosque. It's, it, it's a beautiful uh, building. Uh, they use the finest granite. Uh, they incorporated some Byzantine elements, uh, because some of the craftsmen, especially the mosaics and whatever, were imported from the Byzantine Empire. And it, it was a huge space to accommodate really thousands of worshipers. Now here, here's, the, uh, here's the building. This is the area here, which was the original, and this was the church that was added later. Here's the interior of the old Islamic uh, portion, which essentially was unchanged by the Christians. Uh, they appreciated what a beautiful building it was and, and, and added to it, but really preserved a good portion of the building. The mosque, the grand mosque. And here's the outside of the east wall it's again a very distinctive, you know, picture. Um, it differs from non-Islamic buildings because there's no representation of the human form. So, in a church, there would be um, pictures or sculptures or whatever of um, religious figures. This does not occur in uh, Islam or Judaism, for that matter. Now, if you are inside the building and you are looking at the, the, the other side of the wall, you see this. And this is called the mirab. Okay. And this was the told the congregation which direction was east. So when they prayed, they knew how where to face uh, to, to towards Mecca. Um Again, you know, you notice there is no human form here. It's uh, there are animals uh, that are depicted uh, in, in Islamic art and, and various designs or letters. Here's another picture of it. Quite beautiful, I think. Here's the ceiling. It's just it's just a gorgeous building. Now, next to the mirab is an area that's reserved for the caliph or leader of the city-state, depending on where you are in Spain. And the, the wood, it was no longer in the church, in, excuse me, in the, the uh, old mosque. The church people removed it. This is a picture 
of a, of a uh, Matsura, which is this area where the, where the caliph would be. This is in Cairo in, in Tunisia. Now here's the area in Cordoba. And you can see the Mirab is very close. And so the caliph would be here. Now, one of the reasons why they enclosed it was protection of the monarch. Yet thousands of people praying and they were uh, concerned about his, his um, safety. And, you know, also to give him some privacy. Here's the ceiling of this area. Now, this is a picture of the portion of the Caliph's palace, which is just outside the city. Unfortunately, not much of this palace survives. Uh, it was destroyed. This is one piece that survives, and we'll see a little bit of art uh, from there as well. Uh, just, just to get, this palace was as wonderful as the Alhambra in Granada. The, have, who's been there to Granada, to the Alhambra? Well, it, it, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Here's a, the famous uh, lion fountain and whatever. Now, this was so beautiful that when Ferdinand and Isabella reconquered Granada, they didn't touch this at all. They left it as it was. And so it just gives you some idea of what the palace in, in Cordoba must have been like. Now here is a mosaic. We're gonna look at some art here. This is a mosaic from the, the palace of the Caliph in Granada. And again, you see it's just animals and trees and you know, vegetation that's depicted. It's very fine work. And this was the, the specialty of the Byzantines. If, if you've seen the, um, the Dome of the Rock, in Jerusalem, and they have mosaics around the, 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 the building. It was Byzantine uh, artisans that did that. So that was one of their specialties. This is a jug, a ewer, and um, it, it's made out of bronze. You can see that um, the downspout is a cock or a peacock. And, you know, nice work. Here's an oil lamp with a lion as the handle. The oil would be in here, burning. Here's a, a ceramic piece. Um, now, it's, it's um, an interesting thing. It's called luster ceramics. I, I you know, I, I'd never heard of it before, but apparently you do a series of um, um, uh, uh, glazings, and the last one is gold. So the, this this is all you know a gold compound. Again, you know, I think beautiful. So we're talking about high art. We're talking about a culture which is remarkable. We're talking about. Uh, an area with multiple libraries, with um, universities, uh, with medical hospitals. We're talking about a real, a, 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 an amazing place to live, given the fact we're talking about the Middle Ages. And you remember what large, you know, parts of Europe were like, you know, picture London, in the in the in the tenth century, you know, it, it just didn't compare at all. It was a backward area. Now, what about the Jews of Cordoba? Yeah. They, um, we have the synagogue that was used, one of the synagogues, uh, and this is the courtyard of the synagogue. This is the entrance hall, looking out towards the entrance hall from inside the prayer hall. And this is uh, the woman's section. 
in ancient times, there was a lattice work of wood here. And this is a, a, a niche in which the Torah scrolls were kept. And just look at this. We'll, we'll see this inscription in a bit. And here's the ceiling and upper level. Now, the inscription says, provisional sanctuary and abode for the testimony. The testimony is the Torah completed by Yitzhak Moheb, the son of Ephraim Wadawa, in the year 1315. This is the, uh, obviously the Jewish year, 5075, 1315. So return, O God, hasten to return to Jerusalem. Now here's a map, a, a current map of the city, but here's the Jewish neighborhood, Judaria. And um, this is where Maimonides lived. This is where uh, Judah Halevi, that we'll talk about later, lived, right near the major mosque. Now, what did the Jews contribute to Islamic Spain? Well, first, let's talk about medicine. We know that Jews felt that one of the reasons to be a doctor is that you're keeping people healthy so they can study and pray and be, be better Jews. So it's almost a religious calling to be a physician in the minds of, uh, of Jews. And it was a wonderful place to train because you had data that was uh, from Roman and Greek times. It was the Muslims that maintained these manuscripts, which later, were translated from either from Arabic, which had, you know, the, it had been tra tra translated from Greek to Arabic, and then Jews translated from Arabic to, to uh, um, Latin. So much of the Renaissance in, in Europe later was fueled by these works that were, the Jews, uh, the most educated ones spoke Latin, Greek and uh, Hebrew and Arabic. Now, the three men that we'll later discuss, Hasde ibn Shaprut, um, Judah Halevi and Maimonides were all trained as doctors, but you weren't just trained as a doctor. You were trained in all areas of human knowledge if you were uh, a scholar. You were trained in philosophy. You were trained in poetry. You were trained in, in mathematics. You were trained in astronomy. And you were trained in medicine. As we'll see later, Maimonides did not practice until his later years. Did not practice medicine until his later years. But these educated people, whether they were Jews, Muslims, or Christians, were nonetheless trained in medicine as well as the other areas. So it was not unusual for Jews to be the physician of the Muslim leaders. Like Hazde ibn Shaprut, we'll see later, he was the uh, court physician, or, or we'll see with Maimonides that he became the court physician in Egypt. Jews were skilled craftsmen metal workers, goldsmiths, silversmiths. Now, trade is an important issue. What do you think gave Jews some advantage in the area of international trade? Anyone? They, had, they could speak to the, the local people. So they had immediate community support wherever they were trading. Right. I mean, not only did they speak often the language of the areas they were in, there were Jews all over the Europe, the Mediterranean, the Near East, even the Far East. And so if you were a trader, you were able to stay in the Jewish community, 
wherever you were. And if you were kidnapped, they would ransom you. Hmm. So this was a tremendous advantage uh, for anybody in, uh, in, the, in the merchant class. Also, <laughs> since there was war periodically between the Christian world and the Muslim world, Jews who were not involved in that were, a, were often able to move from one part of, of uh, Europe uh, to another part. And as we'll see with Hazdeh Ibn Shaprut, he became a diplomat who often mediated uh, um, between uh, the Muslims and the Christians, or even sometimes between Christian city-states that were at war with each other. Um, scholarship, uh, we, we, we've, we've talked about. All right, now let's, start, let's talk about Chazdeh Ibn Shafrut. This is a picture of him and the caliph in Cordoba. Uh, so in addition to being the court physician, he was also a diplomat. And uh, he was a, essentially an advisor called the vizier, but they gave him no title. Okay, he, he functioned as a vizier, but they gave him no title. And one of the reasons for that was Muslims felt that Jews should not be in high positions. The people felt Jews should not be in high positions in the government. They felt that only Muslims. So essentially, they had to do that one on the QT. But he functioned just like a vizier. Now, um, because he was a court physician, he took, when he, when he could, chances to get the, um, medical texts where he traveled. And because he, when he was in Constantinople and um, negotiated a, a treaty between uh, Spain and the Byzantine uh, uh, Empire, he was given by the uh, Christian emperor, the Byzantine emperor, a pharmacological text, which he then translated into Arabic, and um, it you know it, it became an important pharmacological text. Just to give you some idea of how many different kinds of roles these people had. Now, one of the things he's famous for is a letter that he sent to Kazaria. Um, how many people know what Kazaria is? Just raise your hand so I can see. Okay. This is a strange time in history for the Jews because there was an independent Jewish empire which was north of the Caucasus and between the Don River and the uh, Volga River. These were Turkic peoples who converted to Judaism in the ninth century. Why did they convert to Judaism? Well, there's a number of explanations, but one was that they were wedged in between the Byzantines and the Arab Caliphate and a way of sort of staying neutral was to use to convert to Judaism rather than uh, either one of the other religions. Now, the, the, there was some knowledge about this empire. It turned out to be a fairly wealthy empire because one of the major trade routes between the Baltic and the both the Byzantine Empire through the Black Sea or down the Volga to the, to the uh, Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate, ran right through the territory of the Khazars and they exacted taxes and whatever. So it, they, they were fairly wealthy. And unfortunately, there hasn't been enough archeology span in the Soviet, the former Soviet Union or in Russia uh, uh, to unearth a lot of knowledge about them. But one bit of knowledge has to come from a letter that was sent by Hazde Ibn Shaprut to the king of Khazaria and a letter that was returned from the king of Khazaria to him. And this is in the 10th century. So um, 
here is a piece of the letter that was sent by Hazde Ibn Shaprut, and it was found in the Cairo Geniza. We'll talk about the Cairo Geniza when we get to the discussion of Cairo, but basically there were millions of documents in this area of the a temple in Cairo that preserved these documents. And we'll talk about why when we get to Cairo. Now, what does it say? Uh, he's saying to the king, uh, we live in the diaspora and there's no power in our hands. He, no, he means there's no uh, uh, kings or leadership uh, uh, in any of the lands that the Jews have. But when we heard from my Lord, the king about the power of his empire, that he, they heard uh, through uh, missions that, that people uh, went on to the Byzantine Empire, and then the Byzantines told them, filled in the, some information about the Khazars, and that prompted Hazde's letter to try to find out more. We learned about your powerful army. We were amazed. We raised our heads. Hazde, son of Isaac, son of Ezra, belonging to the exiled Jews of Jerusalem in Sephirot, Sephirot of Spain, a servant of my lord the king, bow to the earth before him and prostrate myself towards the abode of your majesty from a distant land. I rejoice in your tranquility and magnificence and stretch forth my hands to God in heaven. So this, despite the fact that the Jews were doing well in Spain, they were still mourning in a way the loss of their independence uh, and, and their possession of the land of Israel. And uh, the, the Khazar king responds in the letter, his letter, talking about how they were converted, why they decided to convert. Essentially, the letter talks about the fact that uh, church, church, a churchman was uh, invited a Muslim uh, a cleric was invited and a Jew, a Jew, a Jewish rabbi was invited to the capital of um, the Khazar Empire. And they all gave their reasons for uh, the conversion, why they should convert to their respective religions. And ultimately, Judaism uh, won out. All right, the next person is um, Judah Halevi. And he lived uh, later than Shaprut from 1076 to 1141. And he spent 10 years in Cordoba from 1130 to 1140. Uh, scholars would often move from one city to another. It was not unusual. Now, he's considered by many to be the poet laureate of Jews. He, he wrote all kinds of poetry, secular and religious. And I wanted to um, go uh, to read some of it to you and uh, see what your response is. After I finish a poem, you, anybody can jump in. He wrote love poetry. You have enslaved me with your lovely body. You have put me in a kind of prison. Since the day we parted, I have found nothing that is like your beauty. So I comfort myself with a ripe apple. Its fragrance reminds me of the myrrh of your breath, its shape of your breasts, its color of the color that used to rise in your cheeks. So even though he wrote poetry about God, he also uh, wrote a fair amount of love poetry, which was the standard uh, in, um, in Islamic Spain, the Muslim poets wrote, wrote about love and the Christian poets as well. Drinking songs. This one's called. Well, he, I just want to jump in. You also would have been familiar with the Song of Songs. That's correct. Love poetry. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Drinking songs. This is called the Ooh. Cup Without Wine. Cups without wine are low things, like a pot thrown to the ground. But brimming with the juice, they shine like body and soul. 
And many of these drinking songs were, in fact, sung while they were drinking. He wrote about the, the practice of writing and learning. My pen is my harp and lyre. My library is my garden and my orchard. I like that. He wrote about medicine. My God, heal me and I shall be healed. Let thine anger be kindled against me so that I be consumed by medicines are from you, whether good or evil, whether strong or weak. It is thou who shall choose, not I. Of thy knowledge is the evil and the fair. Not upon my power of healing I rely. Only for thine healing do I watch. So this, the healers, whether they were Christian or Muslim or Jewish, felt that there was a religious component to healing. This is a poignant poem about the fear of loss. And, and he was often chosen to write a poem that was read at, at a funeral of great people that died in, the, in whatever city he was living in. This is called The Fearful, Tis a Fearful Thing. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream to be, to be, and oh, to lose. A thing for fools this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me, to remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing to love, what death has touched. So, I mean, to, to me, I mean, the, the, this really highlights the, the two sides of loving. The joy of loving and then to have to deal with the loss of the person that you loved. Any comment? Too bad we don't have more people like that now. Yeah. Religious poems. This is about Shabbat. On Friday doth my cup overflow. What blissful rest the night shall know. When in thine arms my toil and woe are all forgot, Shabbat, my love. Tis dusk with sudden light distilled from one sweet face the world is filled. The tumult of my heart is stilled. For thou art come, Shabbat, my love. Bring fruits and wine and sing a gladsome lay. Cry, come in peace, O restful seventh day. Lord, where shall I find you? Your place is lofty and secret. Where shall I not find you? The whole earth is full of your glory. You are found. When, we, when was the date of these poems? Uh, this between is the end of the 11th century and the middle of the 12th uh, century. He died in 1141. Okay, so this is pre-Zohar. Oh yeah, but you can see that you can see the the uh, prefigurement of the Zohar here. Yes, exactly. There was still Kabbalah beginning around right. this time before right. before the Zohar. Right. Is it is it just coincidental that the poems rhyme even though they weren't written in English? Uh, okay. What? The, the translations are done by poets themselves and they try to have it rhyme. You know, it, I mean, it rhymes in Hebrew or Arabic and they try to adapt it so that it rhymes in English. But that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's their, um, you really want to have a word for word translation. It's not going to rhyme. Yeah. Poems about God. God, whom shall I compare to thee? God, whom shall I compare to thee when thou to none canst liken be? Under what image shall I dare to picture thee when everywhere all nature's forms thine impress bear? Greater, O Lord, thy glories are than all the heavenly chariots far whose mind can grasp thy world's design, whose word can fitly thee define 
whose tongue set forth thy powers divine. Here's another one. Who is like thee, revealing the deeps, fearful in praises, doing wonders? The creator who discovereth all from nothing is revealed to the heart, but not to the eye. Revealed to the heart and not to the eye. I really like that. Therefore, ask not how nor where, for he filleth heaven and earth. So this, this brings to mind, I think, the emotional and mystical aspects of religion. I mean, we struggle with this. You know, uh, I think many Jews, many Christians, Muslims study with this. I mean, um, struggle with this. But he's basically saying, look into your heart, not, not to try to picture an image. Now, Judah Levy was um, very, very almost obsessed about Zion. And ultimately, at the end of his life, in his dotage, in, in 1140, one year before his death, he traveled to, to Zion, to Jerusalem. And that's where he died. My heart in the east, but the rest of me far in the west. How can I savor this life, even taste what I eat? How in the bonds of the moor, Zion changed to the cross. At this time, you know, the, the, the uh, Jerusalem was uh, occupied by um, the Byzantine Empire. No, it's not true. No, forget that. <laughs> I don't know why he's saying change to the cross. Can I do what I vowed? to and must gladly i'd leave all the best of grand spain for one glimpse of the ruined shrine's dust now this is a poem that's said on tisha um zion will thou not ask if peace wing shadows the captives that ensue thy peace left lonely from thine ancient shepherding low west and east and north and south worldwide all those far and near without surcease, salute thee, peace and peace from every side. So that's that on Tisha B'Av. Okay, now his greatest philosophical work was called the Kuzari, and it was about the Khazars. And uh, again, talking about the, the wonder, the, the, the wonderful aspect of this conversion of a uh, of a Turkic peoples to Judaism, and so in the book he tries to amplify the discussion of the of the Jewish rabbi who uh, who, who comes before the Khazar king, and some people believe that in some ways it's one of the best defenses. And, and uh, of Judaism, and one of the best um, persuasive arguments for Judaism. Oh. Now, he starts off by saying, uh, actually, he, uh, his the rabbi starts saying, by the way, this is also written as a poem. It's a huge poem. Mentions that Judaism has public miracles. You know, Judaism has, you know, the giving of the the Ten Commandments on, you know, uh, on the Mount, et cetera, et cetera, witnessed by thousands of people. So he's saying that, you know, that this is important, that Jews produce prophets, not just one, which is a, you know, com a comparison to Christianity and uh, Islam. Now, he, he, people say, well, one of the arguments against Judaism is why are the Jews, why did they lose their land? Why are they suppressed in various countries? Why are they not doing well in some countries and doing well in others? And he's basically saying that this is not an indictment of Judaism, but it's the fact that Jews are not living up to the expectations and the laws. And that if they were, then things would turn around. Um, so he, he 
completes the kuzari talking about the fact that you know Jews can go to the Khazar Empire, but they also can go to Zion, and it's more important to go to Zion. And here's just a Hebrew copy of the kuzari. Now we're at the 45 minute mark, and I want to just uh, give you a little introduction to Maimonides, sort of as a teaser for the next bit, because Maimonides only lived in Cordoba to the age of 13. And then he left Cordoba and ultimately ended up in Morocco. And we'll talk about why. But this is a statue of Maimonides in Cordoba, in the Juderia, in the area that the Jews lived. And I'm sure that those of you who have visited Cordoba has, has seen, is quite famous. Actually, now in Spain, if you can prove that your relatives came from Spain, you can get Spanish citizenship. So, uh, you know, uh, they, the government's really sort of bending over backwards to try and recognize the roles that Jew, Jews played in Spain. There's another picture in the Now, this is the house that uh, Maimonides' family lived in or at least what they're claiming to be his house. Um, and you'll see in Fez, there's also a place they claim to be his house also when he was living there. Now, I think I'm going to give time for questions and comments rather than getting into Maimonides' philosophical works and whatever. And um, I put it here just in case we, you know, we had some, a lot of extra time, I would start to get into it, but I'm going to save it for the next time. And why don't we take the time for any comments or questions? And I'm going to turn this off. I can't seem to turn this off. Oh, here it is. You can stop the share. Yeah, there it is. So questions, comments? David, how did you develop your materials? Have you visited these various places that uh, you talk about? Yeah. Or is it more through readings and uh, studying others? Well, it's a combination. Certainly travel is one way because, you know, I'm in the habit of spending a couple of months preparing before yeah. I travel. It really increases my enjoyment mm -hmm. tremendously. But uh, when I lived in Princeton, I took every course in Judaic studies that they had. Um, my office was across the street from the university, and I audited uh, two courses in medieval Jewish history. I took Bernard Lewis's course in uh, the history of Islam, and another course about Islam, and a course on Jewish literature. So that was a big boost. That was back in the uh, 1980s. Um, and then, of course, over time, you know, I've given lectures. And one of, the, one of the reasons why I like to do this is that each time I do it, I go over and I learn something new. I mean, this time, for example, I got more deeply into Judah Halevi's poetry. I mean, I, I knew some of it, but I got to read a lot more of it. And I was, uh, I was impressed. I mean, you know, um, buy it. So that that's that's pretty much how. No questions, no comments. It, uh, people are so Great. so 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 you loathe to say anything. <laughs> it's just uh, you focused on uh, Spain. Now Portugal followed a similar pattern, didn't it, in terms of the Golden Age. Uh, and even their, their language is being very similar and other aspects of their culture. Absolutely right. In fact, the Muslims controlled Spain for a long period of time as well. And this uh, toleration of Jews, uh, you know, continued until around 1492. And then when, when Spain uh, was taken over by the Christians, by that time, all of Portugal was Christian. The Pope actually, um, was encouraging them to get these Jews and Muslims out of Spain. And 
ultimately it, it, it happened in Portugal about a decade later. So first, many of the Jews of Spain went to Portugal and then they had to leave Portugal because they were expelled. And many of them ended up in Amsterdam, which we'll discuss in the last lecture. Do we know anything about Maimonides' family in Spain? What did his father do? And were they, um, com were they merchant class? Were they comfortable? Yeah. Um, his father was a scholar and a rabbi. And actually, most of uh, Maimonides' early education was done by his father. And um, his father uh, also, I believe, practiced medicine as a way of making money. But, they, but the family was also involved in trade. Later was on, later though, right? No, no, but they were involved in trade before that, I believe. Uh, and and uh, I don't know the details of that, but I, I remember that that was mentioned when, you know, when I was reading. Were there other branches of the family? Did they, like his father have brothers and sisters? Was there a extended family? Or I don't know that. Uh, I, I mean, his mother, we don't even know her name. You know, mm. I, it was the kind of thing where during the Middle Ages, it, women were just left out of the, of, of the picture. Um, so, no, I, I, I don't believe we know a whole lot. We know, of course, that Maimonides had a brother, a younger brother. Um, and, and I think he may have had a sister as well. But we, I, we don't know much about the family other than his father was in the high rung of society. You know, the, the, the person who had the kind of education, this, this wide ranging education that all of the upper class uh, people would have wanted. But I don't have any more information than that, Lynn, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating how universal, wide, wide-ranging how Levy's poetry was. I yeah. mean, you know, you just don't associate that with uh, anybody who's in the niche of a being a, a religious poet. That's right. That's right. And that was partially a reflection of the society in which they lived. Poetry was greatly loved by the Arabs. And in fact, I think I mentioned there were there were contests you'd come in and, and some the jews would participate too they you know what they wrote in in arabic and uh so they were influenced by the society as much as they influenced the society and actually there was a fluorescence of hebrew poetry really for the first time in centuries in spain All right, well, if we're done, um, I will uh, see you in two weeks when we'll talk about Morocco and more about Maimonides. <laughs>